Welcome to today's worship service. I trust that things are going well with you today. Our target date for reopening and gathering inside our buildings is still June the 7th if co things continue as expected. We'll continue to offer the four venues for our worship services that we're doing now, which are uh, first our online service that we stream from our website, from our church website, also 98.3 FM radio. We also do Facebook Live of the parking lot service, and in the parking lot you can pick that up at 88.1 FM. And uh, we're going to try to continue those things for those who are not comfortable coming inside the building. But please continue to pray for us as we work to make worshiping together as accessible as possible. And on another note, uh, many of you are aware that our sister Pat just went home to be with the Lord this past Tuesday night. Chester and her family appreciate your prayers. as They're working with the directives they have to follow with the funeral home and those kind of things right now. So we, they just appreciate so much your prayers. And again, I want to thank you for your continued prayer support and your financial support of our church family and uh, your faithfulness to our Lord. You're such a blessing to us. And may our Lord's good hand be upon you as we worship Him together today.
in your house, Lord. Be welcome in your house. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence, you never failed me yet. I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love oh, And my heart will sing your praise again promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you never fail your promise still stands great is your faithfulness Faithfulness, I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me
I see you do it again You made a way Where there was no way And I believe I see you do it again I see you do it again Today we're going to look at a second part of the secret of living an effective Christian life. It's, we're going to look in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. Very uh, a significant passage in the life of the children of Israel that we learn from them and in our lives today. Some very important truths that God reveals about Himself. And I want us to really uh, take note of some of these things. First, let me recap. The children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt for over 400 years, God delivered them by Moses. They would not obey Him. They did not go into the land to conquer the land. And for 40 years, they spent wandering in the wilderness. They missed out on the rest that God had for them. And then the second generation, God allowed them to go into the land. They did cross the Jordan River and went into the land. When they got in there, they set up a, a memorial of some stones, and then they took and they did some things. They had a ceremonial circumcision of the men who had been born in that time that had not been circumcised. And then they also uh, set up their camp at a place called Gilgal. And the Gilgal means the rolling away. And God said He named it Gilgal. They named it because the reproach of Egypt was rolled away from them. In other words, they were no longer would be known as slaves who had escaped Egypt, but they would be known as the people of Israel with a homeland. And that's where we are today. So they set up their camp, their camp there, and they're waiting for direction of what to do next. They've celebrated the Passover. Great things are going good with them. And then that night, Joshua has an encounter with God. And I want us to read that in Joshua chapter 5. And these three verses are very significant. We read, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho. Now Joshua was the leader after Moses. He was the one who was leading the children of Israel. And says that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, but as the captain of the host of the Lord, I am now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the host of the Lord, the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoes from off thy foot, 
for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you today that we can come and bow before you and we can pray and thank you for so many things. Thank you for saving us and giving us life in Jesus. Now help us learn how to live so that we'll live our lives that please you and we will be the blessed people you want us to be. Father, help us not make mistakes like the Israelites made when they didn't trust you and they didn't follow you. So, Father, help us trust you. And, Father, we pray for America. We pray for our nation. We pray for revival and spiritual awakening. We pray you turn our nation back to you. We ask you to bind the enemy that he'll have no place in this place or these are the times we're going to be hearing and listening to these uh, broadcasts. And Father, I pray for the outpouring of your spirit. Lord, we ask that you help us, help me to think right and to speak right, and for you to get glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to learn how God compares and gives us a comparison of the Christian life and conquering the land of Canaan, we can learn many things about the way God works. We can learn how to be victorious in living the Christian life. And it is a life of communion with Jesus. That's what makes it victorious. And out of that comes peace, joy, and contentment in our hearts because we know we are striving to live in, in that stride with God and His will. And so in our previous message, we saw the secret of living a life of peace, joy, and contentment meant, and it was always, of considering Jesus first and learning and hearing His Word and believing His Word. I've said repeatedly that a person is blessed, has an abundant life, who, who lives a life of peace, joy, and contentment. That's what a real rich life is, a person who has joy in his or her heart peace and contentment in life. God uh, has a name for this kind of living. It's called, in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, it is called rest. And the land is known, the land of Canaan was known as a land of rest in comparison to the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. God gave them a homeland, which is a place of rest. And this is exactly what God expects for the Christian life to be to us. Our lives in Jesus are a place of rest. By considering Him and uh, we know Him and we trust Him and we follow Him, we can rest knowing that He is our God and that He is going to lead us and take care of us and meet all of our needs. And He is our rest. As we look to Jesus and considering Him and His Word in everything, we do so, we don't have to figure out how to live. We don't have to figure out what's right and what's wrong. We can follow Jesus, consider Him, study His Word, hear His Word, believe His Word, and live out what God wants us to do. Now, we don't do it perfectly, so we're striving to do it because we're weak, but yet God is perfect and His Word is perfect and we can trust Him. I want you to notice how Jesus talked about a rest in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Here's what Jesus said. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So we find in the Old Testament that God gave them the land of Canaan to be their place of rest. And we find in the New Testament that Jesus said in Him we could rest. We can rest from searching. We're not, we don't need to search anymore when we found what we're looking for. The, we find rest in our souls by coming to Jesus, yoking up with Him, and learning of Him so we can learn to be like Him. The rest starts with placing your faith in Jesus. Now, if you've not trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can enter into rest for your soul by coming to Him, trusting Him as your own personal Lord and Savior, giving your life, surrendering to Him, and He will come into your life and be your Lord. See, if Jesus is eternal life, and we have the rest in our souls. See, you don't seek for something that you, uh, you're aware of and you have consciously in your possession. 
you don't seek for it. Uh, I don't look for this uh, remote to change these slides because I've got it in my hand. I, I don't need to look for it. I don't need to search for it. You see, we stop seeking when we find what we're looking for. Example, have you ever searched for car keys? I guess most of us have. Have you ever searched for your glasses only to find that maybe they were in your pocket or on top of your head or maybe you had them on, you were wearing them? And, and so that's because you weren't conscious and you weren't aware that you had them in your possession. Sometimes we don't know where things are and we search for them because we can't find them. And sometimes we have things and we're just not aware. We're not conscious that we have them and we search for them. So those are the kind of things that God tells us. If we want to have rest, we need to know and be aware of who Jesus is, coming to Him, being yoked with Him, and learning of Him. As believers in Jesus, we can find and should find and have rest in Him. And the rest that He gives us happens when we are consciously aware of Him, considering Him, learning of Him, believing Him. So as we look to Jesus to be saved, and just like we did, we do that. But yet we don't stop seeking Him. We keep looking to Him. We keep thinking to Him. We keep leaning upon Him. We keep trusting Him all the days of our lives. And we learn how to live and make our decisions and all of our willful actions we are to learn how to do by considering Jesus first, considering who He is. One of the passages talks about living an effective Christian life and it's used the metaphor of running a race is in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1. I referred to it last week. Let's look at those verses. Verse 1 says, Seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses that with a long list of saints of the past in Hebrews chapter 11. He said, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So here the Christian life is, confer, uh, is, is a, referred to and demonstrated as a race. It's an analogy as a race. So the effect of Christian life is not a stroll in the park. It is a life of conquering ourselves and conquering that which is before us. The analogy of a marathon runner here is it is a long race. It is a race of our whole lives. It is a race where we're conscious now of what we must do and we are conscious of what is in our future. We look at life and we say we're going to be faithful to God. An effective Christian life is life of both striving it is full of uh, toil and grueling grit like a marathon runner. A marathon runner doesn't run in a rocking chair. A marathon runner knows that it's going to be grueling and it's going to be tough. But yet, at the same time, while the marathon runner is dealing with that which is difficult in the race, in the heart and in the life, the marathon runner is pleased that he is uh, running or, and, or he or she is running and and. And the crowd is watching. He said, we're compassed about with this great cloud of witness, these people who, have, who are watching and this whole world and, and that we see how the world sees us. And then we also know that we're conquering those things that are before us. And there's great, great uh, satisfaction and, and gratification in winning and accomplishing. So the Christian life is, look, it's like a runner. The runner runs and that he knows that there's going to be some grueling hard stuff. There's going to be some hills to climb, going to be some obstacles to overcome. But he also runs with hope of finishing the crossing that finish line and winning the race and coming home with crowning achievement, representing the one or the nation he or she represents. So let's visit the secret of the Christian life and let's uh, think about that. In the next verse of Hebrews 12, it says this, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. See, that's like that runner. Runners don't run out of drudgery. They run with joy because they like to run, but yet at the same time, they like the results of having ran a good race. So now you look at this and you say, oh, yes, uh, they, Jesus went to the cross. It wasn't fun. It was hard. It was difficult. There was nothing uh, pleasurable about it. But yet at the same time, the pleasure inside him was joy because he was doing the right thing. He was doing what his father wanted and he could knew that when at the end of that, he would sit down at the right hand of his father at the throne of God. You see that in verse 2. Then he says, for consider him. 
that endeared such contradiction of sinners against himself. He died in our place. We're the sinners. He was the righteous. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. See, runners have to win in their minds before they can win on the track. You have to believe you can win, and you have to believe, and you have to trust. And that belief for us is believing God. It's not believing our abilities to win, but it's believing God's ability to help us and to get us across the finish line. To be careful not to make considering Jesus a complicated thing, because it isn't. Uh, just simply look to Him and consider Him. So looking to Jesus has the idea of getting our marching orders, getting our directions, getting the, our positions in life, our opinions, getting them from God. And considering Jesus means this. It means to consider Him, to take Him into account that we would not bring a reproach to His name. That whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we seek to become, we want to represent Him well. We want to consider Him. That's how you win. See, the secret to the Christian life is considering Jesus, hearing His Word, and believing His Word. Now, I want you to see three things from our Joshua passage. The first thing is a good examination. That night, Joshua was standing there wherever he was in the camp there over by next to Jericho, the city of Jericho that they would soon conquer. This night, Jesus appeared to him. This is who the captain of the Lord told us was. It was the pre-incarnate Christ. He appeared to Joshua, and Joshua would receive from him directions on how to conquer the nation or that, I mean, that city of Jericho. And they did. And he gave them, and we're going to look at that in coming days. But here, so Joshua comes and looks around, and he's standing there, and he sees this man with his sword drawn. And Joshua sees a man with a sword drawn. Listen, that's, he doesn't recognize the guy. And then all of a sudden, he sees this guy with a sword in his hand. Now, we've got to remember, Joshua is in, a, in, in the new homeland. He is in the land of Canaan. He knows he has a lot of enemies there that are going to want to kill him. So he says to them, he, he comes to the person and says to them, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? In other words, he says to them, whose side are you on? I'm sure many of you are aware that there are things and people in our world, in our lives that are good for us. Man, God has blessed us with so many wonderful people, so many wonderful blessings, so many wonderful pleasures. I mean, our lives are so good because God has been good to us. And, and these people that we love, our family and our friends and our neighbors, those that are so such cl close to us, and they, they can make life so joyous. And we should praise our Lord for them. We should praise our Lord for all of the good things that He does for us and He gives to us and all the people that are so precious to us. But likewise, you know that this life is also has its problems, has its obstacles. It has things that are not good for us. There are adversaries in our world. Joshua was aware that he had comrades around him and he had adversaries possibly around him. And so he says to them, look, who are you? Are you for us or are you for our adversaries? See, uh, these adversaries, they work against the, us having a lives of joy and peace and contentment. They don't want us to be faithful to Jesus. They don't want us to continue to run the races of our lives for honor and crowning achievement for Jesus. Joshua was aware of his circumstances. He knew that he was in a, his new homeland. He was enjoying that. If you read these chapters, you read that they were eating now of the land, the food of the land, and they were enjoying their land. But now they also knew they had enemies to deal with. So the Christian life has both challenges moment by moment, but it also has wonderful things both by moment by moment. We can rest in confidence in God that God is bigger and better and stronger than everything we'll ever face. This is the way we're to live. We're to live like marathon runners. Those who know that there, is, there are some grueling things in front of us, that life is difficult at times. It's not a stroll in the park all the time. But yet at the same time, we know that life is good in many, many ways. And we can reach the finish line with our Lord's pleasure of us. So runners run with both struggles and joys. I have an African-American friend who is a pastor. Actually, we both serve on a, a ministry team at the, with our state convention. The, 
And not long ago, I saw on Facebook this past week, actually it was just a couple days ago, he put on there, he said, if you see me out running, he said, please stop and kill whatever's chasing me. <laughs> he's a pretty big guy and he's kind of a hilarious guy. So he said, if you see me out running, you got to know something. I'm running from something. Stop and kill it. Well, you know, uh, I think that would be true of a lot of us. If you see us out running, something is wrong. Something's chasing us. But this life of the Christian life is something that all of us are to do. We're all to run and we're all to run with faithfulness. Now, the second point I want you to say, and I think this may be the most important point of the message. I really think this is the heart of what God is showing to us. So Joshua says to this guy, he says, are you, aren't thou for us or for our adversaries? Whose side are you on? Now, it's interesting how Jesus answers. And he said, nay. He said, no. But as captain of the host of the Lord, I am come. Now, here we know it's a precarnate Christ because if it were an angel, Joshua would not have been permitted to worship. Angels always stop people who fall down and try to worship them. The only ones who receive worship, these angelic looking beings, would be God. And this was Christ who came because he's the only one we worship is God. So Joshua fell on his face to, and to the earth and did worship and said, What saith my Lord to his servant? So he says to him, said, Joshua says, Whose side are you on? He said, Neither. I'm not on your side and I'm not on their side. I am the Lord of the host. Now, what does that mean? Here's a point of truth. We need to know that God doesn't come to take sides. He comes to take over. Do you hear me? God doesn't come to say, take sides. He comes to take over. That's what Jesus said. He said, look, I didn't come for your side or their side. I come to take over. I'm the Lord. I'm the captain. Jesus came into our lives to take over. This means we can wrongly think that God has joined us rather than we have joined him which can put us in danger to think that we are leading our lives and it's okay with God. Expecting God to follow us around and for God to bless us in whatever we decide. That's not how the Christian life works, although some try to make it work that way. And they're very frustrated. And they, it always ends in emptiness and disaster. You see, your modern world has told you that you're the most important one and that you can decide what needs to happen in your life, and God will sanction whatever you decide. I want to tell you, that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible didn't come to decide with me and what I want to do. The God of the Bible, Jesus came for me to side with Him and what He wants to do. Let me give you some examples. In our world today, and in some churches and denominations, people think God is on their side to the point that they can make the rules, that they can decide what's right and what's wrong. And somehow they sign God's name to it, and He's just going to come along and say, yeah, it's okay. In our culture today, in many ways, God has been reduced to man's servant rather than man being God's servant. So many in our world live like heathens. And then when troubles come, they expect God to come and bail them out. Or they expect that, that Jesus is just a ticket to heaven or a band-aid to fix whatever they want to do in their lives and when their lives mess up. Now, I want to tell you, He does help us and He does fix us. But He doesn't do it because we've got a good idea. He does it because He's Lord. And He does it for those who look to Him as Lord. Listen, it's not an effective Christian life that operates thinking that God is obligated to answer us. No, we're responsible to answer God, to do what God wants. A victorious, victorious Christian life is made up of looking to Jesus, considering Him. And you know that's in opposition to considering ourselves. You see, the battle in the Christian life, one of the battles of the Christian life is that I die to myself and I live to Jesus. That's a great struggle for me. I'm not just trying to beat up on people out there. I'm just telling you, 
But our world's in trouble because they don't know who Jesus is. They've rejected who He really is in a lot of ways. Oh, you ask them if they know Jesus, and they'll say, yes, but the Jesus they know is far different than the Jesus Joshua met that night. Jesus is not one who caters to your every whim, to my every want, to my desires. Jesus is the one who has called me to come unto Him and yoke up with Him. And when I yoke up with Him, He leads me in the right direction. I learn of Him, and I learn to be like Him. I find His peace, joy, and contentment in my life. If I pull against Him, it's not going to be a life of peace, joy, and contentment. What I mean is, man thinks that God is on his side when he does. He tends to make his own selfish plans. And then he expects God to bless those plans. That's not the way the Christian life works. We don't make our plans. We go to the Word of God and find out God's plan and join God. Now, I do, I'm not saying we don't have plans in our lives about things in our lives. Yes, but we seek God. And we get peace in our hearts as we make those decisions, and God knows what's going on in our hearts. You see, people expect God to bless whatever they, they do, and whatever they want to do, whatever they want to believe. Well, God is not like that. He is, he's not looking for advice. He's not looking for counsel. Matter of fact, in Isaiah 40 and other places, God tells us that he didn't get any counsel and he doesn't take any counsel from man. He's got his own wisdom and his wisdom is far greater than ours. What God is looking for is for people who will die to themselves and live for Jesus. That's what he wants. When a person of church or a nation treats God like they are wiser than he is, I want to tell you that, that person or that church or that nation is in big trouble. Jesus is Lord and he came to be Lord. He came to take over. And he saves those who come to him as Lord. Those who will come to him trusting him as Lord and Savior, he will save. And those who live and stride with his lordship find themselves with his guidance, his strength, his help. Joshua, not knowing who this, it was the pre-incarnate Christ, said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And Jesus said, neither one. I'm, I've come to take over. I am the captain of the Lord's host. See, if you want to have an effective Christian life, you've got to give up your life. And when, what you're going to find is when you give up your life, you're really finding life. Because Jesus is life. He's not only life now, he's life eternal. Jesus Knowing in your heart that you're serving Jesus, striving to be the man or the woman God wants you to be, and even though none of us do it perfectly, we're all weak, but yet when you strive to be the person God wants you to be, you can know in your heart that God is pleased, and He will keep working on you, keep working in you, keep changing you. As long as the bottom line of your life is you're going to call the shots, you're not ever going to know the joy and the peace and contentment that God wants you to have. But the bottom line is also that when you give up your life and you say, I'll do your way, Jesus, I'll do what you want, then you can know that he will give you his peace, his joy and contentment. What America needs, including me and all of us, is we need a fresh, striving heart to surrender to Jesus, to follow him as the Lord of our lives. Instead of expecting God to adjust to our ways, we should adjust our lives to His ways. Let me give you an example. Our, cult, our cult, culture, excuse me, our culture may continue to buy into a corrupt, immoral perversion, and you see it and I see it, that exalts a man and a place to decide what's right or what's wrong. God has never wanted man to try to decide what's right or what's wrong, and when man does, he always gets in trouble. Man tends to think uh, and, and his thinking tends to be selfish and, and deceptive and willfully sinful. And God isn't buying into it. You can put God's name on it. You can talk about God. You can say good things about God and say how that he understands you and he understands your sin and you understand your rebellion. But I want to tell you, God's not buying into that. And you shouldn't either. For instance, God has made his word very clear. 
His plan, let, just take one of the things that's raging in our, our society today. A man or a woman. Uh, marriage. Look, when you think about this gender, God decided who was male and who was female, and that's God's business, and God did that. Now, I have no bone to pick with anybody particularly. I mean, I'm not fighting anybody. I'm just trying to tell you what God says. I'm telling you the truth, and you want to hear me. You need to hear what God is saying. Not because I'm saying it, because it really doesn't matter. Maybe you say, well, brother, your opinion is wrong. Well, look, go to the Word of God and find out what God says. Really, my opinion is no better than yours. But what God says matters, and it's really all that matters. God expects for a man to be with a woman in marriage and a woman to be with a man in marriage. Unless he gives the gift of singleness, and that's uh, con many convictions, a lot of godly people who are single. But you know what I'm talking about. God knows what's right. And man never has the authority to change what's right. God expects for a man and woman uh, to get married and then live together. In our society, so many people live together before marriage. And God said, that's not right. Don't do it. If, you did, if you're doing it, get it right. Get married. Don't do that. And if you did and it's in the past, ask God to forgive you. Listen, you can argue with God. You can argue with me. You might win the argument with me, but you won't want to win the argument with God. You really want to know what Jesus, who Jesus is? He's captain of the Lord's host. He came to take over. He didn't side with me, and he didn't side with you. The question is, am I siding with him? There are people, and on another, another page of this, there are people who have nothing to do with the church. They think, you know, they say, well, I got me and God's got our own little thing worked out. Well, you don't find that in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible did God say that he and somebody has their thing worked out. God says that we ought to be a part of a church family, working together, striving together to exalt the name of Christ. And listen, some people treat Jesus like he is simply a ticket to heaven or a band-aid to fix their lives whenever they need him, and then they go on and live their lives as independent from him and his church and his work, and they just, uh, you know, they just tip their hat every now and then, so to speak, to him. But I'm telling you, God is not into that. The God that man creates in his mind is a God that gives a license to live like that man wants to live or that woman wants to live. And God says that's not the God that he is. He is the captain. He is the one who calls the shots. He is the one who has the followers. He has always been and he always will be the holy and righteous God that he is. He never changes. We're being told in our modern progressive culture that there are new revelations from God. That man is, uh, that God is compliant with man and man has uh, got his corrupt whims and ways and that, man, that God is okay with this and okay with that and approving this and that of what man wants to do, even though it's obviously in defiance to the Word of God. That's not the God of the Bible. That is so wrong. We ought to feel sorry for people who fall into that. We ought to desperately pray for them. We ought to pray for their souls. Pray that God would open their eyes that they know the truth. The position God has in the world is the second point, is He's always the same. He's the holy, righteous, true God that He always has been and He always will be. He knows what's right and He knows what's best for us. He knows what's best for you. You say, well, Brother Larry, I, I've gotten my mind convinced that my sin is okay. and what God, I know what God says about it, but for me, it's a, listen, God loves you but he's not going to join your side. He's not going to come to your side. You need to understand that. He wants you to come to him. He wants you to join him. Jesus is here to be our guide. First, he's here to be our Lord, but then he wants to guide us. He wants to lead us. He wants us to yoke up with him. He wants to be our life. He wants to be our rest. He wants to be our considerations. He wants our lives lived around Him and about Him and in Him. He wants everything about us to be in Jesus because He knows that's the best life we can have. God never changes. Now, His methods change. He does things differently to reach different cultures, different times, different periods in history. But His righteous, holy standards never change. Then the third thing I want you to see, the last thing, is the position we must take before God. 
So we see that Joshua, he, he considered, uh, he looked into his life and said, is this thing good for me? Is this guy standing here? Is he on my side? I mean, he decided with us, is this an adversary or is this a comrade? He found out that God's not either one in a sense of joining man. He's captain and we can join him. Then we see the position that God took, that Jesus took, when Jesus said, I'm the captain of the host. I'm not deciding with you. I'm not siding with them. I'm telling you what, you side with me and you'll conquer the land. Christian, listen, don't try to get God to side with you. You side with him. You join yourself to him. You connect to him. You find out what he wants and you adjust your life to him. And you're going to find peace, joy, and contentment. And if you don't, your life is going to be like a spiritual roller coaster. That's just the way it is. Jesus is God's answer. So as we think about the position we must take before him, look what Joshua does. Joshua falls down before him, we saw in the verse 14, and now he tells Joshua to take his shoes off. And Joshua does. Removing one's shoes was a reverent, humble sign of surrender and submission and recognition of the manifest presence of God of a holy place. What did Joshua do when he encountered Jesus who, who came to take over? Well, he fell on his face and then he said this, what will you have your servant do? Lord, what do you want me to do? See, that's the way we come to God. Lord, what do you want? Not coming to God saying, here's what I want, and I'm going to make God fit into my box. Because God's not going to fit into your box. He's not going to fit into my box. Let me just tell you, all of us who've lived very long with Christ have tried that. I would say all of us, I know I have. We've tried to make God fit into our plans. We've tried to do it our way. Only to find out that our way always has the stain of selfishness and sin in it. It always winds up being about us doing what we want to do like we want to do it in opposition to what God wants. And it always messes up. We always wind up hurt. We always wind up with things we regret, things we can't go back and change. Now, this rest is... Before God is, he says, look, I just want to bow before you and I want to, I want to live in your land. Joshua does, I want to follow you. He, Joshua, that's what he wanted. He falls down before the Lord and he's willing and humble, submissive, looking for direction. But there's another thing about rest. When I thought about taking off the shoes, I have a neurop neuropathy problem with my feet. And if I'm on my feet for very long, they begin to burn. And every night, it just seems like every night is they're burning and I'm thinking about this, and I'm looking, and I thought, when he said, take off your shoes, I thought, well, after all, being on my feet for quite some time, sometimes it is so good to take my shoes off. Sometimes it is so relaxing, so restful. And so when he came, uh, Joshua came, it was uh, a sign of humility, but it was also a sign of surrender and rest. While life will be filled with pressures and toil, at the same time, life is full of rest. If you know Jesus, if you follow Jesus, you can have rest, rest in your soul. Our bodies labor to do God's will. And at the same time, our souls can rest while we're laboring. When we know that God is pleased with our lives, listen, the Christian life is hard work. Serving in the church, doing ministries and jobs in the world, it's, it's labor. But God is so good to us to give us this work. But this work has joy because it, it's not that the body's finding joy in running the race, but the mind is finding joy in accomplishing the purposes that the runner knows is set out for him, that accomplishing that course. Here's the verse of Scripture that God says in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Look what he called it, labor of love, which if ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. 
Did you notice what he said there? He said, God's not going to forget the hard labor you've been in. See, some of you are in families and it's tough. You're staying strong and you're keeping your eyes on Jesus and, and the road's not easy. Do it for Jesus. Labor for Jesus. Some of you are in places in life and stages of life and your body suffers and you struggle and you're hurt. And it's not easy, but you can do it for Jesus. You push on for Jesus. Some of you are working in ministries and in church ministries and you're serving and the place sometimes it's hard. And the work is grueling and difficult. Yet, at the same time, you do it for love, there's joy in it. It's kind of like a mom. When I think of hard labor and love, I think of a mom in a home. And I think of parents providing for kids. I think of mom over a hot stove. Or, or the parents, uh, both of them working and whatever uh, they do to... Uh, benefit and provide for the family. And yet, it's hard labor. But yet, at the same time, there's joy in doing it because of love. I can watch, um, I watch my mom and I can watch my sisters. I watch my wife. I watch other ladies in our church families and I see them. Uh, they'll provide and prepare meals. And there's a lot of hard work goes into those meals. But they'll do it with joy. I see Eddie Black do that. He does it uh, often. And he just loves to do it. It's hard work. But at the same time, there's joy in the midst of the work. There's a love, that, a joy that love gives that gives great satisfaction to the worker. And God said, let me tell you this. You write this down. You take note of this. I'm not going to forget the hard work you do for my name, for my people, and for my work. Don't you ever forget it. God's not going to forget it. Listen, if we merely serve for what we get out of it, we probably won't do it very long. But we've got to learn to be consistent that we're doing it for Jesus. We're striving for Jesus. And when we're striving for Jesus... Yes, it can be labor. Yes, it can be difficult. But there's a joy in knowing Jesus is pleased. If you strive for Jesus, your life will count. The work is still hard, but you can have the joy of knowing you're doing it for Him and you're doing it for the people that He wants you to serve. The position we must take before God is an humble place of submissive surrender to Jesus who is the captain of an innumerable host of angels, an army of angels. Listen, I want to be sided with Jesus, and I want you to be sided with Jesus. I didn't say any of the things I said to beat up on you. I said it hoping that God's Holy Spirit will awaken your conscience and show you who you're really serving. Are you serving Jesus? Are you serving yourself? Are you serving according to the Spirit of God or according to your flesh? Are you deciding how you're going to live your life? Or are you following the captain of your salvation? Jesus is Lord, so let's strive to join Him. Let's strive to be connected to Him. Let's not do our own will, but let's do the will of God. I want to tell you that God loves you. He is so concerned for you that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, that if you would believe in Him, you would have eternal life. I want to say it one more time. God's not joining us in what we want to do. We're to join God in what He wants. How do you know what He wants? You go to His Word. You go to His Word, and whatever He says in His Word, that's what He wants. And it's not going to change. That's the way it is. Pray for me that I will adjust my life to Him. And I'll pray for you that you'll adjust your life to Him. Let's pray. Father, I pray for those who are listening and those who will hear this. 
I pray, Father, that their lives will be adjusted to Jesus. That they'll stop making excuses, stop rationalizing. And Lord, where they know their lives are not aligned with Jesus and stride with Him, that whatever it costs, whatever it is, those adjustments will be made. God, I pray for the same thing in my own life and my family. Lord, I pray that we will be found striving for Jesus, following with joy and peace and contentment your Son, the captain of our souls. It's in His wonderful name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His. And we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours.